Welcome to another edition of Zeek in Action. I am your host, Richard Baitlick, and in this video, we'll be taking a look at how to use Zeek as well as a, a related tool to learn more about a new asset that you have discovered on your network. I'd like to thank my boss at Corelight, Greg Bell, for the idea for this podcast. And with that, let's begin. Now, I'm going to use the starting point for this video uh, being an entry that appears in my infrastructure logs. This is a snippet of a log from a Ubiquity asset display, and it shows that there appears to be a new Apple device. Uh, I've redacted the front end, so we'll just call it MBP, presumably for MacBook Pro, and that it uh, first appeared on this network on the 5th of July in 2021, and last appeared, or was last seen, on the 19th of July, uh, which is when I'm actually filming this video. And you can see that they've had a decent amount of data transferred up and down. Uh, but most crucially for our investigation, we have a MAC address. And that MAC address is what we're going to use to try to learn more about this asset. So we can see the MAC address right here. And if we were doing an investigation, you might want to have a notepad or something, and you'd write down that MAC address. Now, before we get to the Zeek logs, I wanted to show uh, another possible way you could investigate the appearance of this asset. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rumble, it's a, a startup uh, headed by H.D. Moore, who is a very uh, famous security uh, researcher and coder and entrepreneur. And I really like this offering that he's created uh, called Rumble. And I believe you can just go to uh, rumble.run or at least rum Google Rumble and you'll get to the company. And they make a, a free version of their software that I'm using here that you can use to scan a class C address space. So here I'm logged into the Rumble interface and I'm doing a search for the MAC address that we saw in the uh, Ubiquity infrastructure log that appeared previously. And uh, what you'll see here is that there are no entries for that MAC address. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, it all depends on how you have a, an active scanning asset like Rumble configured. I personally use it to scan this local network once per day. So what that means is if the asset under investigation was not online during the time when Rumble was configured to scan, there won't be any records for it. Now, if this is a persistent asset on this network, chances are it'll get hit by a scan at some time. But if this is an intermittent uh, asset, if this is a, a visiting asset, a guest, uh, a device to that uh, of that nature, then perhaps we won't have a record of it in Rumble. Now, just to show you that uh, Rumble can find such an asset, I modified my scan and uh, I ran it again. And I had it just scan the local network and see what it could find. Uh, just as a word about what Rumble does. Rumble is an active scanner, so uh, uh, it's very complementary to a passive network discovery system like Zeek that is watching traffic, creating records, and then providing them to an analyst. Rumble, on the other hand, is more like uh, something like Nmap, where it is performing an active scan. It reaches out to the network using a variety of clever techniques, and it saves what it finds in this uh, very user-friendly display. So upon completing this new scan uh, of the local network, and I am performing a search for the MAC address in question, you can see that I now have a record I have this, uh, presumably, this MacBook Pro, and I can see now that it has been assigned an IP address of 192.168.4.167, and uh, it was first seen eight minutes ago, and it was last seen eight minutes ago. So what this shows you is that um, this is the first time this device has been identified on this, this network of interest. So we have an interesting um, piece of information here based on the MAC address. Uh, we now have the IP address. But this isn't the only way we could get the IP address because this is a, uh, a video about Zeek. So let's see what Zeek has to say. Uh, I presented this as, a, as an alternative, um, and we may have more to say about it in the future. Uh, at the very least, though, I would recommend taking a look at it. Uh, I use it. It's a wonderful asset. Um, and like I said, the trial version is free for a, a local Class C network. 
but to our Zeek data. Now, in the spirit of the videos of the Zeek in Action series, I try to present a different way to look at Zeek data, uh, more or less in every video that I create. And I've gone through different methods, whether it's been a command line or using try.zeek.org or uh, other displays. Here I am showing the Humio dashboard that I have uh, set up for uh, one of the test sensors on, on this network that I'm examining. And uh, you may have heard Humio was bought by CrowdStrike, so congratulations to the team at Humio. Um, I have an account there that has approximately seven days worth of data, so that's what I'm looking at right now. So I uh, put in a very simple search. I'm searching for the MAC address that we had identified earlier from the infrastructure log. And uh, the MAC address resulted in uh, four entries here in my Zeek DHCP log which is helpful because now uh, presumably if I have the right data, I can transfer, uh, uh, transfer this MAC address to an IP address based on DHCP. And when I do that, I come down here and I take a look and I see that the client address is 192.168.4.167. Now, Humio is nice in that it gives you different ways to look at this data. This is a fields-based uh, version. There's a message-based version and a JSON-based version. If I go to the JSON-based version and I just copy that information uh, in a text form here, this is what it looks like. So you can see that uh, the client was assigned uh, this 192.168.4.167 IP address, which is the same as what we saw in the Rumble output uh, a few minutes ago. Here's the MAC address of interest. Uh, notice that the client requested the 192.168.4.167 address, meaning it had already received that in the past. And if you remember when we saw the last seen date uh, from the Ubiquity log, we know that this asset had already been on the network before, although it had not been captured by uh, Rumble. If I were to go further back in other Zeek logs that I have stored, I would have records of, of this IP address. But based on this, we now have a second confirmation uh, of the MAC address being associated with this IP address of interest. And with the IP address, now we have a little bit more information that we can use to search our uh, Zeek logs. So if I were to do something fairly simple and just put in the IP address of interest, 192.168.4.167, and I put it into the Humio uh, search function, I get a whole bunch of uh, results back. Uh, the results that are showing here is simply the timestamp and the raw string version, which will give you the path. So that the log type essentially, whether it's con or SSL or DNS, um, the place where the data is being written to, a timestamp, and, and other uh, data. The interface that I'm using here for Humio uh, does have some uh, nice dashboards built into it. Uh, now, these are Corelight dashboards, but they're the sorts of dashboards you could get with many other systems. You could build them yourself if you wanted to. Uh, I'm just showing them here in the interest of trying to, trying to display yet another way to share uh, Zeek data with the world. So here I access this Corelight DNS dashboard and put in the IP address that we are interested in. And you can see various uh, outputs that have been listed here. Uh, I'm never a fan of pie charts uh, because I'm a, a disciple of Edward Tufte and I highly recommend taking his uh, visualizing information class. You can go to edwardtufte.com or just Google Edward Tufte and you'll find out why you never want to use a pie chart. But um, uh, in case you're wondering, a table is always better than a pie chart, and there are no exceptions. Um, if you d disagree, I'll debate you all day on that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you take a look here, you've got uh, various queries and, and the results and the counts, and you can start to see what this system is doing on your network. And uh, you know, thus far, it doesn't look like it's anything uh, really out of the ordinary. Uh, the question would be, of course, you know, what is this system? What's it doing here? And you'd want to approach this uh, investigation with that in mind. If I take a look at the HTTP dashboard, I can see a little bit more information here. And uh, the HTTP dashboard is not as comprehensive as it may have been uh, once upon a time, because this is based on simply seeing clear text HTTP, but it's still a place to start. In fact, anytime you're investigating an unknown asset, uh, I like to start with DNS because it more or less it is a clear text type investigation. If you have any other protocols that are clear text, they're also a, a good place to start. Not the place to finish necessarily, but it is uh, a source of information you can review. 
Here I am taking a look at the connection log. And uh, what caught my uh, eye with this log is that uh, although there were 584 outbound connections in the time span uh, that we're looking at, which apparently is the last 24 hours here, um, there was one incoming connection. And this is not something that I would expect on this network because uh, in order, now presumably uh, believing that this is an accurate record, it would mean that there has to be some type of NAT translation. And in fact, there may be may have to be more than one NAT translation uh, going on between the outside world and the inside world in order for someone on the outside to be connecting directly in to a system on this RFC 1918 private address space. So for me, that's very interesting because if that is the case, then we may have more of a problem here uh, as opposed to simply uh, a visitor to the network who is using it for authorized purposes. It's also entirely possible that we may have a Zeek record which has simply been flipped. Uh, in other words, it assumed a, an originating IP address that was really a destination IP address. But it does provide us with a, an interesting uh, opportunity to look and see what, what might be happening here. If I uh, scroll down on the display, I can get a little bit more information about that, that one connection. And as you can see here, this uh, top outbound data flows by originator has the IP address in question. So you see that there's only been one connection. Uh, it says no gigabytes of data transferred. You know, we'll, we'll have to see if that's, if that's true or not. Um, and we have uh, the, the uh, opposite data over here. And of course, again, this 172.253.122.188 uh, address looks interesting to me. The 172, uh, when I see this number, it starts to make me think of Google. That could be completely wrong. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that because it's a Google associated IP address, it's good. But um, just sort of as a gut instinct when I first see that, I, my guard changes a little bit. However, let's go ahead and do a search and find out what we can about that. Um, now, when I search for that IP address uh, in this console, it gives me this uh, query by default. And I can look here and see that here is the originating host again, this 172.253.122.188. And it's talking to our 192.168.4.167 system. Uh, you can see that it has an originating port of 5228 and, and a, a response port of 63781. Those don't mean anything to me offhand. Uh, we do have a con state and a history we could take a look at. So, uh, you know, this by itself, and we can see this, this data pass, by the way. Um, uh, 24 bytes or ridge bytes and, and uh, no, uh, no response bytes. So I look at this and, and I say, well, you know, there's really not enough here for me to understand what is potentially happening. Is there another way I could get some more information about this IP address? And as you might expect, um, there is. So what I do is I just do a, a pretty simple search for uh, my, my original IP address of question 192.168.4.167. And I essentially pipe those results and do another search for this, uh, this odd 172 address. And as a result, I get the records that are listed here. And thankfully, you've got, in addition to some con records, uh, there's some DNS and some SSL records. And I'm probably going to get some type of identifier as to what's going on based on either the DNS or the SSL record. So I choose to take a look at uh, one of these, and this is one of the DNS records. And when I do that, I see that there is a DNS request for this IP address. And the result is that it is a uh, mobile-gtalk.l.google.com is the, is the resolution for it. And when I see that, it makes me think, okay, this must have something to do. Well, first of all, it's, it's a, a assigned to Google, which makes me feel a little bit better. And secondly, it appears to be something associated with uh, Google Talk, uh, which I could see trying to maintain uh, two-way connectivity in order to enable um, Google communication via voice. Uh, and it is possible in that respect that in the process of maintaining that two-way communication, uh, Zeke assumed that the communication was initiated by the outside. Uh, and it's even possible that that happened by virtue of the uh, a temporary 
uh, nat transversal or double nat transversal as the case may be um, set up by uh, UDP uh, uh, Stun or stun protocol or something like that. So when I see this, I don't I don't begin to think that there's something very uh, unusual occurring here. Here is an SSL uh, record. So we saw that there were CON, DNS, and SSL records that were available. Uh, here's one of the SSL records, and you can see that the uh, in the SSL um, information, the server name is mtalk.google.com. So again, this must be associated with uh, mobile talk or Google chat or something to that effect. Uh, so this makes me feel a little bit better that this is not something that I necessarily have to worry about. So that uh, brings this video to a close. Uh, my goal was to show how you could use Zeek data to investigate the appearance of a previously unidentified asset on your network. Uh, this is just one way to do it. There are potentially lots of ways to do this. For example, you could uh, produce your own list of new assets as they appear in Zeek so that on a periodic basis, whether daily or every 12 hours or every six hours or whatever interval you chose, you could have a report of assets that are new on the network and potentially some snippet of data about them. You could also perform that sort of query in your SIM or other log aggregation system and produce a report that shows you, hey, you've got a new asset. Um, now, it's important to realize that if you have a dynamic environment where IP addresses are being shared by many systems, that simply using an IP address uh, alone is not going to be enough necessarily to identify this asset. Uh, I was lucky here in the sense that the asset in question uh, had already been on the network. It, it, it requested that IP address again, and the uh, investigation window was fairly narrow so that I didn't have to do a lot of um, trying to piece together a changing IP address with a stationary MAC address. But this might, might, might not be the case in your environment. Uh, if you found this interesting, please let me know in the comments. If you would like to show how you investigate a new asset on your network, um, please feel free to uh, get in touch with the Zeek project. Uh, Zeek.org is our website. We have a very active uh, Slack that you can access from the Zeek.org website as well. We're always looking to bring in new people to talk about how they use uh, Zeek and Zeek data. So uh, feel, free to, feel free to get in touch with us and let us know how you use the software. Um, also, feel free to uh, join any of the community calls. All the information is on the Zeek website. And with that, uh, thank you for watching this video, and please stay tuned for the next in our series on Zeek in Action.